Good morning. Welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley's Sunday Forum. My name is Matt Courtney. I'm the recorder and a member of the board of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the humanist community if you have not already done so. Membership forms are available on our website at humanists.org. That's humanists, plural. If you're listening for the first time, welcome, and we invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find all our events on, are listed on the website, humanist.org. And please aid us in continuing to present these forums by donating to the humanist community. You can find out how to donate to our organization on the website, humanist.org. Also, our treasurer usually posts in the Zoom chat a, an address where you can send checks. I do see him on the, uh, the call, so he can uh, post that there. Uh, and we definitely need money. We uh, are spending money, even though it's less now that we're not renting out a, a space in Mountain View. But we do have expenses, so please donate to the, to the group. So today's forum topic is Mini Law School Supreme Court 2020 Review of Major Cases, A Humanist View from Professor Leland Chan. Uh, he will look at the Supreme Court's major decisions during the 2019-2020 term, uh, and including a bunch of different things. I don't want to go over everything. I'm sure he will list them out in the beginning of his talk. But Professor Chan is an attorney who teaches con constitutional law at Golden State University, or Golden Gate University. I was going to screw that up. Yeah, he also teaches classes to the general public who have an interest in the Constitution and the decisions of the Supreme Court. All right. Leland, Jen, you are good to go. All right. So I see my mic is uh, on. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm going to share a screen. Uh, preview. Here we go. All right. I hope everybody can see that. Um, Matthew, by the way, um, I just want to make a proposal. My talk will naturally break out into about three different sections, and if you want to. I can um, uh, take a break in, in between the major sections in order to have uh, some discussions and then go on. Uh, is that something that you want to do, or should we try to push everything to the end? Uh, it's kind of up to you. The problem if you break in the middle of your talk, um, we could get a lot of questions and not have time to move on. Uh, but if you feel like that's a better way of doing it, uh, we can do that as well. You know, we have a fairly small group. Um, I'd like to try to do that. Um, okay. uh, and, and I can try to time it so that uh, we will maybe push off some questions toward the end. Okay. All right. So let me go to the beginning. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is uh, always fun for me. And um, uh, the first thing I should address is what do I mean by a humanist view? of the Supreme Court decisions. And what I really want to focus mostly on today, other than to talk about the major cases, is uh, just how do Supreme Court justices come to their uh, decisions? Um, because they're not supposed to be having, they're not supposed to have opinions, really, in the sense that they're not supposed to have preferences, they're supposed to be neutral, right, judges. Uh, and yet, uh, it seems to everybody that they're actually biased or at least political. And so I want to address that, kind of referring to some of what we know about um, human nature. So today we'll cover some of these cases. I won't go through them now. We'll, we'll get to them. The first one, which was surprising, um, is called Bostock versus Clayton County. And this was a 6-3 decision. This was the decision that essentially the court said that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 
And that's a long time ago, right? That's um, about more than 50 years ago, Congress passed a, a major bill that basically says no discrimination in employment based on a number of factors. Uh, one of them was uh, including sex. And the question before the court in this case was, well, what does sex mean other than just uh, gender, right? Male, female. You can't discriminate against women, for example. Um, so the question here was, well, does sex also mean you can't discriminate against a person who, uh, based on uh, gender identity, based on uh, gender, uh, based on sexual preference, sexual orientation? Is that included in the meaning of sex? So the three plaintiffs in this case are, um, to your left, you see uh, Gerald Bostak, he's the lead plaintiff, uh, Bostak. Um, he was a worker in um, uh, Clayton County uh, in Atlanta, uh, near Atlanta. And um, he was fired when a coworker saw him play uh, in the gay softball league. Um, and so he sued the county under the Civil Rights Act for uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation. In the middle, Donald Zarda, he was uh, an instructor for, among other things, uh, skydiving. And um, he was fired when he uh, mentioned to a customer that he was gay. And he only did that because uh, he tried to fend off accusations that he was uh, feeling up a, a customer, a female customer, uh, during one of the, the uh, trainings. On the right is uh, Amy Stephens, Stephens. Um, she uh, uh, was uh, a man uh, for, uh, and, uh, for a number of decades, was the funeral director uh, at, at a funeral home. And, and, and later in her life, she decided to uh, undergo a transgender uh, procedure and became Amy Stephens. And for that, she was fired. So all three were fired based on either their uh, sexual orientation or sexual identity. So um, the surprising thing was that uh, um, this was actually decided by Justice Gorsuch, who was a Trump uh, appointee, and also concurred um, in the judgment by Justice Roberts, who um, joined the four liberals in, in getting the 6 v decision. Here's what the Title VII says. It says, um, uh, it makes it unlawful for any employer to make an adverse employment decision or otherwise discriminate against any individual, quote, because of such individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And just to make this a little bit more interesting, as late as last year, the House of Representatives actually tried to amend the um, Title VII in order to make it clear that it includes protection to both based on sexual orientation and gender identity, but the Senate hasn't acted on some of the bills. So in other words, the legislature has tried, and this is not the only time, they have tried numerous times in the past without success to expand the definition of, of discrimination based on, on sex. So what happened? Well, as I mentioned, um, Neil Gorsuch and, and, and Justice Roberts joined, joined the Liberals. So that raises the first question that I, I want to dwell on, and I'm going to take a departure for about 10 minutes and talk, talking about these cases. I want to talk a little bit about how judges decide and what we know about moral decision making. So the question is, well, don't the Supreme Court justices vote their politics? And of course, um, the answer is supposed to be no, right? Um, the Supreme Court justices are not voted on. They're not supposed to be influenced by um, popular will, uh, by their employer, uh, uh, by the government. They're supposed to be neutral, right? Uh, justices often say that they're just umpires. They just call the balls and strikes. They don't make the rules, and they can be trusted to be neutral and not favor one party or the other right off the bat. But at the same time, we can all be forgiven, I think, for even asking the question, right, are, just, are justices political? Because if you, if you just look at the confirmation process, for example, it's one of the most political events that we have, right? And if you look at, well, 
Justice Thomas, for example, wow, he's conservative. And almost every decision that he's going to make will be of a conservative bent. Uh, similarly, Alito. Well, in contrast, uh, we have Justice Ginsburg, who will, is pretty reliable liberal vote, right, in any of these decisions, uh, and so forth and so on. So what, so what gives, right? Aren't judges supposed to be these um, uh, ultimate rational machines? Are, are they supposed to be, unlike mere humans, um, be able to put away their biases and, and act like, like judge, judges? So what do we know about moral decision-making? Right? Are judges exempt from the normal rules? So as humanists, I think that we probably fancy ourselves to be rational beings, that we look at evidence, we, we, we uh, respect science when it's done right, and we um, make decisions based on rationality and evidence, right? And that, in fact, is what the Greeks, uh, Aristotle, Plato, uh, Socrates, they thought that, that our brains, our ability to use our rational brains, really what makes us humans, right? We're the rational animal. But beginning in the, um, the Enlightenment, sure, that idea still persisted, but it looks like one of the Enlightenment philosophers, David Hume, and you, you've heard this before, what he believes was the opposite. He believed that, no, we have our reason, but it really is our passions that govern our decision-making. And his famous quote is, reason is, and ought only to be, the slave of the passions. Reason is a slave of the passions, right? So passions are on top. And can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. This is not a, an idea that is foreign today. You, some of you may know Jonathan Haidt. He's a famous uh, social psychologist. And he helped develop something called the Moral Foundations Theory. And he says, basically, that when it comes to decision-making, especially moral decision-making, he says that intuitions come first. Strategic reasoning comes after in order to justify what we already believe. In his book, The Righteous Mind, which is a very good book, um, he, he says this. People tend to make their decisions instinctively and then try to find evidence to support their point of view. We apply confirmation bias. We engage our, quote, internal lawyer to supply reasoning, to support our views that already fit our emotional beliefs. So that is, in essence, what moral foundations theory says. So it, um, so it pays then just to take a brief moment to look at, well, what are those foundations? What are those moral sentiments, right? And hate, Jonathan Haidt um, uh, took, a, took a survey of them, looked at all the literature, and found that there were literally hundreds of these moral senses that we have, right? But he distilled them into five major categories. And I want to go through those five major categories. And I want, you to, I want to mention a couple of things about them. One is that liberals and conservatives differ, right? Differ, if you put these categories on a spectrum, liberals and conservatives will emphasize them differently. And, I also want to say that um, uh, the, how, we, how these, these sentiments shake out have direct policy implications, right? So let's start. So one, one major uh, moral sentiment is care and avoiding harm, right? Just, just not hurting people. So that's obviously a moral, a moral sense. Um, and liberals tend to be stronger in this category. Conservatives, of course, care about people as well. They, uh, they want to avoid harm, but on a spectrum, liberals are stronger in this particular standpoint. So for example, Black Lives Matter, right? Black Lives Matter deals with the injustice, right? The injustice of hurting people by authority, right? Liberals tend to care about that more. Conservatives, a little bit less. Prison conditions, right? Concerns about prison conditions, a little more. Death penalty, avoidance of harm, right? Um, provision of affordable housing, criminal justice reform, health care uh, insurance for all, welfare. 
The next category, the sense of fairness and proportionality. This again is stronger on the liberal side. So the archetypical liberal um, concern is income inequality. So for liberals, when they see huge disparity in income, they see a lack of fairness, right? Um, they favor safety nets, right? They favor, they favor more of a, a progressive income tax. But they're, they favor maybe socialism over free markets, uh, all relative terms, I understand. They favor affirmative action. But on the conservative side, they say, hey, we believe in fairness too. But there's this more a sense of uh, you reap what you sow, right? Uh, a little bit of inequality is okay. Um, if you try harder, you deserve more. Uh, if you don't work as hard, you deserve less, right? And now we get to um, a third one. And here we, we shift more to the conservative side, right? Liberals don't tend to look at the, the group loyalty or in-group cohesiveness, right? The idea that you protect the people who are similar to you. They don't really see that as a strong foundation of moral senses, but conservatives tend to do so more, right? So the idea of America first, America first, a uh, strong military, uh, skepticism, skepticism over things like the international community, right? Kind of uh, yielding your sovereignty over to international organizations like the UN and the WHO, right? Immigration, right? America is for Americans, not the other, right? The fourth one is authority and respect. This is the idea of a law and order. This is the idea that you, you obey the law, that you comply with community standards, right? Uh, traditional values, this again is stronger on the conservative side. Um, uh, organized religion, uh, again, military hierarchy, less tolerance for diversity because it tends to kind of mess up this idea of cohesiveness. And finally, this idea, and this one, the, the liberals tend to be way uh, on, the, on the one end of the spectrum and, and uh, conservatives on the other side of the spectrum. This is the idea that um, you have purity, cleanliness uh, as, as a form of, um, of a moral, moral value. So respect for the American flag, um, uh, respect for religious symbols like crosses, patriotism. Um, how did the LGBTQ rights come here? Well, there's a sense that um, if it seems wrong from your gut, right? If you're, you happen to be a, uh, a heterosexual person and, and the idea of gay sex, for example, um, displeases you, that, oh, that's, that's impure, right? Chastity, sex before marriage, condom use, uh, contraceptives, all those um, are moral issues, right? Opposition to obscenity. So, so what are we getting at here? Basically, what, we're, what I'm trying to say, convey the idea is that we all come um, into life with certain moral senses and we make our decisions and our judgments based on these moral senses. And these senses have actual policy implications, which for example, all the judges, right? All the judges, are making these decisions. And my proposition is that they make these, these decisions based on these moral sentiments. And if you happen to be the conservative, you will make decisions one way. If you happen to be liberal, you make decisions another way. However, that really works against us in terms of judges, right? Justice is not supposed to be biased in that, in that way. Let me just finish this point off by looking at a study from the National Academy of Sciences. What they show, found was that if you take very controversial topics like stem cell research, human evolution, climate change, and they looked at your likelihood of your position, excuse me, your position on these things based on how much you know, and also based on how much education uh, you have, how much knowledge you have. Here's an interesting finding, and this confirms everything I'm talking about. They say, we found that where religious or political polarization existed, it was greater among individuals with more general education among, and among individuals with greater scientific knowledge. The study is consistent with several previous studies that show political conservatives, for example, 
are more likely to dispute the scientific consensus on climate change if they have more education. So in other words, the more knowledge and education you have, the more likely you would be stronger in your political beliefs. How about that? So now, and, and then one plausible explanation for this finding is the notion of motivated reasoning, namely that the more knowledgeable individuals are more adept at interpreting evidence in support of their preferred conclusions. If you, if you are sm uh, greater at uh, the skills of uh, reasoning, then you are more likely to be able to take facts and evidence to support your, your goal. So we finally get back to the judges, right? Judges are, whatever you think of them, are very educated and they have not a lot of knowledge and they are, are practiced in, in reasoning. And so judges, if, if anything, you can say judges probably have the greater ability to actually use all kinds of rationalizations in order to get the result that they believe is correct. And, then, and that is, I think, the key to asking the question, hey, aren't judges political? And the answer is basically no, not formally, but they are so good at rationalizing that they always get the results that matches their own personal politics. So, so what are the toolbox, what's in the Supreme Court justices' toolbox, right? How do they pull off neutrality? Well, the things that I'm gonna talk about actually are gonna be very familiar to you in a sense that they use logical fallacies and, and certain cognitive, um, cognitive uh, shortcuts in the same way that we all do. The big one, I'm not going to go through all this, but the big one is they apply a judicial philosophy that happens to correspond with their own values. And I'll give an example here in the moment in the Bostock case. So, for, so if you've heard me talk before, you, you know that judges, uh, if you're conservative, you tend to go more on the um, original intent side. In other words, whatever the Constitution says, you know, it was written in 1789 or the 14th Amendment in 1868. Um, if, you, if you interpret the Constitution uh, based on the original meaning, right, then very likely you're not going to find new ideas in the Constitution, like, for example, abortion is a constitutional right or the right to marry, even if you're gay, uh, that that is protected by the Constitution. But if you are liberal, then you tend to favor more uh, interpretation that is called um, living constitutionalism, in which you apply uh, current values, modern values, uh, to the words of the Constitution in order to create new constitutional rights like abortion and gay marriage, right? So it's not that the justices are they vote a certain way because they politically think it's the best way. No, no, no. They're using a judicial philosophy of interpretation that happens to get the result that they tend to agree with already. What else do they do? Um, the, well, they rely on different premises or value the, the premises differently. So they come to a decision with different premises, right? So this is a matter of just pure logic. Um, they'll selectively uh, give the facts in, in different ways. They'll apply past cases differently. A classic case of cherry picking, right? Cherry picking is uh, something you know very well. Uh, ignore contrary decisions, which, which is again, motivated reasoning, right? If a decision comes out a way that doesn't really help your side, you tend to diminish it uh, and so forth. Appeal, appealing to authorities, Right. So, so, so with that as background, then we know. Well, I want to just do some illustrate then, uh, in, based on the cases that we're going to talk about today, just how judges pull off this idea uh, that they're neutral. So, back to the Bostock decision, Justice Gorsuch. What happened is Justice Gorsuch a, a closet liberal? Um, does he actually favor personally um, rights uh, for LGBTQ community? Um, no, actually not. What Justice Gorsuch, uh, pro, what he personally supports is a form of interpretation called textualism. And, and textualism, in, in a nutshell, 
essentially just looks at the words of, of law or, or constitution and, and gives it the meaning based on the words used by who wrote them, in this case, the Congress of 1964. It doesn't, he doesn't try to uh, read the minds of the legislature. Um, he doesn't even care too much about the intent of the bill. He just looks at what the words were used. And the key words here in Title VII was there's no discrimination, quote, because of sex. And what just, Justice Gorsuch uh, reasoned um, was this. Um, if you're an employer and you're going to discriminate against a person because that person is gay, as we saw among the three uh, plaintiffs, Mr. Bostock in particular, um, then they, if you query the employer and ask the employer, why did you terminate the person? Well, if you, if you got an honest answer, the person would say, well, because he's gay. Well, what does it mean? What, why can go further? You say, well, what I mean is that Mr. Bostock is the man who prefers to have sex with another man, right? Now, what the employer just did was to say that he discriminated against Mr. Bostock because of sex, right? He referred to a man wanting to have sex with another man. And please forgive me, this is not how I'm defining what being gay is, but this is just for illustration. What Justice Gorsuch says is, well, based on the text of the law, you just discriminated a person against a person because of the fact that he is a man. You refer to the, the word, the, set, the, the idea of sex twice, you violated the law. Very simple. Similarly to Miss uh, Amy Stephens, right, the transgender. Why did you fire her? Because she uh, was a transgender. What do you mean? Well, she was a man who underwent a procedure and then became a woman. Here again, the employer referred to sex twice, and that was the motivating reason for terminating a person. So based on just that flat interpretation, based on Justice Gorsuch's interpretation, he says the law, uh, the law applies. So. Um, um, that's how that's how he did it. Now, if you contrast that with Justice Alito, who dissented, and Justice Alito applies a, a different form of interpretation, he would actually look at and look at, for example, the the meaning of sex in 1964, uh, and perhaps the purpose that was in the heads of the legislatures. Right. So he says in this decision, in his dissent. Our duty is to interpret statutory terms to mean what they conveyed to reasonable people at the time that they were written, 1964. If every single living American had been surveyed in 1964, it would have been hard to find any who thought that discrimination because of sex meant discrimination because of sexual orientation, not to mention gender identity, a concept that was essentially unknown at the time. He's probably right. He's probably right. There's no doubt. And the parties who argued this case for the three individuals didn't even try to imply that Congress actually meant in 1964 that this would include transgender and gay individuals, right? So Justice Alito, if you ask the question, well, is Justice Alito, Alito just a homophobe, right, who always vote against uh, gay rights, he would say no. He's merely using a manner of interpretation that looks at the meaning and purpose of the words when they were written and says, oh, it looks like it's not. And by the way, he was the one who pointed out that Congress has, as late as last year, uh, tried to amend this very statute in the way that the judges did today in, in, this, in this case. And Alito flat out says that what the court did in the 6 3 decision was to legislate. The court did what Congress could not do. And he says that legislation is the province of Congress, not the courts. So that um, actually uh, takes me um, away from the first, uh, the first uh, part of this. And um, um, I'll be glad to just quickly answer any questions if anybody has to right now. Before going to the next section. Any questions? Um, 
You can use the raise hand feature that's the, uh, the button at the bottom of the participants window. I don't see anybody uh, waving their hands. Nobody has their... Okay, Chuck is using the clap button. <laughs> I don't know if that's supposed to be the wave hand, <laughs> raise hand or not. Um, I'll go ahead and try uh, Chuck real quick. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, just a quick question on the legislate part of that. Uh, why is the court so reluctant to do anything that they think should be done through legislation instead? Because Article uh, 1 of the Constitution says the legislative uh, power rests with Congress. Article 3 says that the courts have the judicial power, which is, you know, I think what you want, right? I mean, I'm not sure that we, we, we want judges, the courts, to do what they're supposed to do, which is to adjudicate disputes, right? So take a baseball example, right? Um, Major League Baseball says that if you have three strikes, you're out. Do we want the judge, i.e. the umpire, to say, you know, I really like this particular batter. I'm going to give him four strikes. Is that the role of the judge? Or if you, if you are a union member, let's say, and you go, you go in front of the, the judge, and there's a, there's a uh, another easier one. You are picked up with drunk driving. And let's say that the, um, the limit is, is 1.0 on, on your blood alcohol, right? And you go before the judge, and you were tested, and it turns out that you were actually only 0.9. But the judge says, you know, but I don't like you very much. I'm going to say that for you, it's 0.9. That's legislation, right? And judges, the center role. So in, in a nutshell, that's why, that's, why, that's why judges are not supposed to legislate. Okay, have, uh, Alex and Senna. Yeah, I was wondering when you talked about uh, what was it, uh, textualism, isn't there a danger over time that words can... The meaning of words can change quite a lot, and that, that could get out of hand. Uh, I imagine that would be something that Alito was worried about, too. Well, somebody's got to interpret it. Um, yeah, and, and all the fights go to exactly that question. How do you interpret it, right? So if the Eighth Amendment says, no cruel and unusual punishment, wow, what does that mean? Uh, you know, at some point, you have to insert some value into it, right? Or you can say, well, let's look at history. If, if in history, if you got hung, uh, then, wow, that couldn't be cruel if when they, at the time that they wrote it, they hung people, right? Yeah. Or you can say, no, 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 no. We apply values, uh, current values, and we say, no, no, today we don't believe in hanging. So it, this, is, this is inevitable, and this really gets to the crux of the problem, if you will, as to judges and the, and the public fighting over what is the proper way to interpret uh, anything. Thank you. All right, I don't see any burning questions, so I'm going to go on because otherwise, uh, well, I think we have, we, right, we, have... We, we, we do have uh, a little bit of time, so I'm going to share my screen again. We had two more people with their hands up. Oh, you did? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I have Helen. Uh, Helen, uh, I think you just muted yourself again. <laughs> Try it again. Uh, there. there you go, Helen. Yeah. So I guess um, Alito is the remaining originalist after uh, Scalia died um, because he doesn't want to go past anything that's you know, not on the, on the book, so to speak, in interpretation at the time the law was written. <laughs> well, we still have an originalist on uh, at least probably a couple. Yeah, well, he's, he, he's better. It seemed like he, he and, and Scalia were the ones who were most known to automatically do that, but maybe Thomas as well? Yeah, Justice Thomas is a pretty strong originalist. Um, and, and the other ones are not... The conservatives um, are not uh, strong originalists, but uh, certainly Thomas is, yes. Thank you. Okay, we have D 
Dana, St. George, or is that Jerry? I don't know which one. Yeah, I, on that uh, explanation about um, sex, I wasn't sure whether the difference he was making was talking between sexual identity and a sexual act, or whether he was talking about the difference was because one judge looked at it from a different historical perspective and therefore applied the values of that era to his decision making. So it wasn't entirely clear to me that explanation. So, so Gorsuch, who wrote the opinion, used textualism and said that just based on the words of the statute, which is basically what judges are supposed to do, right? They're supposed to interpret. Based on textualism, uh, he said that these discriminatory, these terminations were made um, because of sex, right? They would not have been made but for in reference to sex. And that was enough for him. Uh, just to say that, you know, uh, and just because of that, that fell in, the activity fell into the words of the statute. Right. Somebody like a, 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 a Alito, he said that when we're interpreting words for a bill, a law, like the Civil Rights Act, he says you look at what the meaning of the words as intended in 1964. Right. So that's why he made that, that illustration that if you, if you polled any person in 1964, what is meant by sex? They would have said, oh, man, man and woman, not gender identity, not, uh, not sexual orientation, right? Okay, thank you. Good thing. Okay, uh, now that, that's everybody's hand. Um, so if you wanna move on? All righty. So back to this, okay, so the next case we'll talk about is, um, commonly called the, the DACA case. Um, I'm sorry, it's not, it's the June Medical. Tell you what, I'm gonna go to, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'll talk about June Medical. This is, this is the interesting case where, this is the Louisiana statute that made it um, a requirement that any uh, abortion provider <clears throat> has to register with a hospital within 30 miles of that clinic uh, in order to offer abortions. And this was, again, a, a, a surprising decision in which Chief Justice John Roberts sided with the four liberals and, and held in favor of the abortion clinic to strike down the Louisiana law, right? Um, so the question, again, is raised, well, well is Roberts soft on abortion? Um, is, does, does he want a result to favor um, the clinic uh, because he wants you know, broader abortion access? And of course, the answer is no. In fact, this is the first time that Justice Roberts ever um, voted um, uh, in favor of abortion rights. And he, and he, when he wrote his, his concurring decision in this case, he actually said that he would have voted against June Medical in favor of upholding the state law. Uh, in fact, in a case in Texas only four years ago called the uh, Whole Woman's Health versus Hellerstedt, he did in fact vote uh, in, to uphold that Texas law. Uh, he was in the minority at that time. Um, and so this case is the identical law, basically. It was taken from Texas and enacted in Louisiana, even though the Texas law four years ago was, was overturned by the Supreme Court. So the answer to the question is Robert saw from abortion, no, but why did he vote in favor? Uh, with, why did he vote with the liberals? And the reason he did so was, uh, again, a, a, a legal principle called stare decisis. Stare decisis is that principle that says that, um, that if you had a properly decided case in the past, then that case stands, right? You stand by that prior decision, stare decisis. Um, especially if it's identical, right? And in this case, the Louisiana law was identical to the Texas law that was struck down just four years ago. So Justice Roberts was not about to allow the court just because the makeup of the court has changed, right? Justice Kennedy retired. Um, you had the addition of two new conservatives. 
right, Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch, just because you have a change in the makeup of the Supreme Court, that should not be a good enough reason to just ignore a precedent, a case that was decided just four years ago. And that's why he, that's why he voted the way he did, right? Again, not instituting his own values necessarily, he's basing his decision on a legal principle. I won't read that, but that's basically what he did. Again, let's contrast um, uh, what Samuel Alito, who was in the minority here, he says, our precedents rarely permit a plaintiff to assert the rights of a third party, and June Medical cannot satisfy our established test for third party standing. So you can say, well, is Justice Alito always just voting against abortion providers? Well, maybe yes. Does he, in his heart, uh, oppose to abortion? Maybe yes. He's, he's, a, he's a good Catholic after all. But, but, but the reasons that he states, remember, getting back to this idea that we, we come to a position from a, a moral sense, and we back into that decision using logic, right? What was his logic? His logic was that for any kind of abortion challenges, think Roe v. Wade, right? The challenge has to be made by a woman, not by an abortion clinic, right? If you're talking about the, uh, this law being an infringement, a substantial burden on a woman's right to choose, then the proper plaintiff is the woman not the clinic. And that's why he voted in that way, in that sense. Right? Again, think of this rationalization. Here's a different form of rationalization, Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas, from the very beginning, believes that Roe v. Wade was uh, wrongly decided, makes no, no bones about it. Um, so based on that alone, he would say he would uphold the Louisiana law because there's no constitutional right to an abortion at all. So why is the court even stepping in, right? He says, quote, this court created the right of abortion based on an amorphous, unwritten right to privacy, which it grounded in the legal fiction of substance and due process, right? Abortion is a legal fiction, right? Who does he quote? What does he quote? Well, he quotes himself, right, in this case. That was his own, his own, his own goal. So again, again, I'm kind of saying this agnosium. Does Justice Clarence Thomas oppose abortion? He may or may not. But the reasons he gives is not that he opposes abortion. He is saying flat out that the Constitution says nothing about abortion. Therefore, the abortion is not a constitutional right. So. Um, I normally take a break here as well because this is a new topic, but I'm going to, if you have any questions, I encourage you to just put it in the chat so that you won't forget it. I'm going to go on to um, the next one, DACA, and then I'll finish off with some religion, religion cases, which I think we'll be interested in. Okay, so send your questions to chat so that you won't forget it, and I'll get to it after this presentation. All right, let's look at the DACA case. This is, this is a case, um, you remember the DACA refers to deferred action uh, on, on childhood um, uh, and on, sorry, deferred action on childhood. God, I forgot the last, I'm sorry. You know DACA, right? DACA basically provides for deferral of um, deportation for children of, elite, of uh, non, uh, of um, non-documented, undocumented aliens who came here as a child by their parents, right? So this program was instituted by President Obama. He did it by executive order. It's important to remember this. This was not a law that was passed by Congress because President Obama couldn't get it through Congress. So he issued an, an executive order that created the DACA program. So, so this case, in some sense, is very, very easy. If you have one administration <clears throat> issuing an executive order creating DACA, that, if that administration changes, the new administration is entitled to change their priorities 
and say, we're not going to have DACA anymore, right? If you create it by executive order, you can eliminate it by executive order. But the problem, what happened here is that the Trump administration was simply um, incompetent. The way that DACA was eliminated by the Trump administration was that the Attorney General Jeff Sessions wrote a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security back then, Elaine Duke. And the very next day, Elaine Duke terminated the program, terminated DACA, issuing a memo. And, and why did she do that? She says, based on the Attorney General's opinion, uh, DACA is illegal, uh, specifically, the provision of benefits, i.e. social security numbers, the right to work, the right to go to school, uh, paying taxes, all those provisions of benefits was illegal, according to Jeff Sessions. And therefore, Secretary Duke says, we're eliminating DACA. So it was challenged by, by a lot of entities, and it went up to the Supreme Court. Um, and, and Chief Justice Roberts here again sided with liberals. Is Roberts in favor of DACA? No. His rationale is that under the Administrative Procedures Act, which basically is, a, is an omnibus kind of a, not a law, that says that any time an executive issues a regulation or takes an action, at the very least, you have to use reasoned analysis. You can't just willy-nilly do something just out of a fundamental um, premise or, ba or basic uh, value is that you explain to the American people why you're doing something, right? You just can't just act um, like a king who says, I'm doing this because I want to, that's it. And so what Justice Roberts says is that in this situation, um, uh, there's, there was a lot to be lost by the 700,000 children or so who are benefiting from, from DACA. And at the very least, you have to explain how and why you are doing this. Now, you said, well, Jeff Sessions explained why, right? No, well, Jeff Sessions talked about the benefits being illegal, but they didn't, he didn't say anything about the forbearance from deportation that said anything about that, right? In Justice, in Secretary Duke's letter, she eliminated the entire DACA program, including the forbearance part, without explanation. And that, Justice Roberts says, was without reason analysis. It was arbitrary and capricious. So, so anyway, so that's, that's what, um, that's the rationale that he used. Um, and it's not because he somehow personally favors the DACA program. In fact, he left open the door and said that the Second Department of Homeland Security can try again, right? They just have to use reasonable analysis and explain why you're doing this and how you're going to accommodate the very legitimate reliance interests of all those individuals who have relied on DACA so far. All right. I'm going to quickly go over the uh, religion cases of this term. Um, the first one is Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. This is a 5-4 decision. This is more your classic decision, five conservatives on one side, four liberals on the losing side. And this has to do with, um, uh, with uh, state funding for religious schools. Now, for 60 years or so, this topic has been contentious. And the idea from the Establishment Clause, right, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, that has been interpreted for a long, long time to mean you can't use public money to support religious education, right? Taken to the extreme, you can't have the Congress saying that we officially endorse the Catholic Church and we can use public tax money in order to, to support the Catholic Church, but only the Catholic Church, right? That's an establishment clause problem. But we've interpreted the establishment clause rather broadly in history. to say that, no, you can't use religion, excuse me, money to support religious education, period, right? None. But that principle has been eroded over time. In this case, um, in this case what the 5-4 justices said was that um, 
if a if you have a scholarship program um, and you allow parents to use a scholarship to go to a private school that is non-religious, but not if the school is religious, then that violates the other religion clause, which is the free exercise clause. And the free exercise clause says that you cannot infringe on the free exercise of religion, right? So this basically says that the, uh, in Montana, if, the, the, if you if try to exclude using monies to support religious education, that violates the individual's free exercise rights. And this is a big deal. This is a pretty big deal because many, many states have a constitutional, constitutional provision uh, called uh, Blaine Amendment. This is, originates back in the Grant, uh, President Grant era, which basically says what this one says, no, you know, no aid policy, right? No aid to religious education. So this really raises the question whether other states, if they have such scholarship programs, and if they, they too try to not violate the rule against aiding religious education, those constitutional provisions, and there are about 40 of them, about 40 states have these, um, then the enforceability of those uh, constitutions are not done. The next case is um, Our Lady of Guadalupe School versus Morrissey Burrow. Uh, Morrissey Burrow is a teacher. She was fired after taking leave. And then um, the church school uh, hired somebody who was younger. So she sued the church school, uh, which is a Catholic school, um, on the basis of discrimination under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Basically, fired her because she was older. And um, so what is at stake here is a rule called the ministerial exception. The ministerial exception is actually is an important concept. It basically says that the state should have no say as to what kind of minister any church would want to retain, right? So classic example, the United States government will have no say as to who's going to be the Pope or a Cardinal, right? Nobody can sue the Czech Catholic Church because um, Pope Francis is not gay or that we've had enough men, how about a woman now, right? Even if you have a valid law, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you cannot go after a church because of this ministerial exception, because we don't want governments to be, to be um, dictating issues like who's going to be a minister. The problem here, though, is that churches tend to uh, want to expand this ministerial exception. So they will apply it not only to the Pope or a cardinal or a bishop, but also to teachers, also to, to people way down the organization, right? Which is a big deal because now if you're going to say you can, you can fire uh, line employees, well, you might not even be Catholic, uh, based on this ministerial exception, then you basically undercut the purposes of these employment laws. So that's, that's the, uh, the issue here. And the last one I want to talk about is um, uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor. This has to do with the same law that the Hobby Lobby case was dealt with. This is the Obamacare law. Um, after, after the Obama administration and Trump came in, uh, Trump issued two rules that vastly expanded the exceptions for Obamacare. Obamacare had a rule that um, some basic minimal essential coverage for health insurance, if you're an employer, has to include a wide range of preventive care, including uh, contraceptive care. But the, um, the HHS at the time of Obama allowed for an exception for religion, right? Uh, and also from certain nonprofits. What the, what the, Trump administration did was substantially expand that exception. So even if you are a for-profit corporation, even if you're IBM, you're publicly traded. If, you, if you're IBM and you want to say, I have a religious 
um, objection to providing contraceptives, they don't have to do it. And, and the, the administration also provided a moral objection, which says, hey, it doesn't even have to be religious, right? If you have some problems with, with um, the use of condoms, then you don't have to offer this kind of insurance. So that was a 72, 72 decision in favor. Some of the, some of the liberals um, uh, went along, Justice Breyer and Justice uh, Kagan. Um, and that's that. So I know I skipped over a little bit, but I'll be glad to take uh, questions on that. So anyway, let me just conclude. Bottom line, what I'm trying to say, judges are human beings. They have their moral biases, right? We all do, right? They don't necessarily vote their moral biases, but they employ their in inner lawyers because they're both inner lawyers and outer lawyers, right? They're, they're all lawyers. And they use rationalization, they cherry pick, they do all the same things that we all do. Now, confirmation bias, in order to reason our way to positions that we already agree. Judges do, judges do the same thing. Theirs is just much more elaborate and much more harder to detect. All right. So I'll be glad to take questions. Uh, I think we have a couple in the chat. Did you want to catch those first? Or All right. We Let do have one hand raised. Those. For some reason, I don't have my... Can you read them for me? I don't... For some reason, on this view, I don't see my chat button. Uh, you don't see the chat? Oh, I'm sorry. I, do it. I see it now. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Arrivals. Thank you. Deferred action on challenge arrivals. How does the Supreme Court deal with the PEAD Trump extra powers? PEAD. Can you tell me what that is? I'm not sure. I think they're. Do you want? Uh, is the same person has their hand up? Uh, Susan, Susan, yeah. Do you want me to unmute them and? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Susan and Roy, there. There you go. Okay, it's Roy's uh, question. He'll go yeah. for it. Go ahead. Yes, this uh, uh, is very current. Uh, I just heard this morning about P E P A E D. Oh. Uh, and. Uh, DNA may be reversed, but it's the superpowers of the president. And I just wondered, it may come up very shortly to the Supreme Court, because uh, uh, first of all, I heard not too long ago that if uh, Biden wins and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Trump doesn't release his in, in January, the two things can happen. Either uh, uh, the, uh, Nancy Pelosi can take over due to a uh, uh, small part of the Constitution, as in that they can be filled in on January 20th if it's undebatable. Also, I heard one uh, general said that if Trump doesn't move out of the house, uh, the military will take over. So well, uh, I just wonder where the Supreme Court will be coming in on this uh, crisis. Okay, well, if it does, then we'll talk about it. I, I have no idea how to respond to that. Um, so. The next question says, uh, so this talk is all about politics and how to convince people one way or another. I'm not, I'm not um, trying to support, for example, the idea that judges should be political. Uh, if I've conveyed that, I certainly don't mean to, uh, to do that. I'm trying to explain, uh, first of all, what tools that judges have in their toolbox in order to decide. And they all use, uh, I would say, legitimate uh, reason, uh, skills and, and tools and concepts uh, of reasoning in order to get to the positions they want. Now, maybe there's only a thin line between what I just said 
and 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 whether judges are flatly, you know, voting their own values, right? Maybe there's not much difference. But what I'm saying is that when they write their decisions, they apply legal principles that are acceptable to mostly everyone. Yeah. Uh, Yvette says, just go straight with the facts here and be partial as to the information you are providing. Or oh, maybe even be impartial, maybe you want to say impartial. Um, okay, I'll take that as a uh, comment. Can we just call any pushback on a decision based on I don't want to legislate as a failure of the judge to actually interpret the law instead? Um, you know, you know, uh, I, I want to say again that in general, in general, we don't want judges to legislate, okay? Let's, let me give an example. In Citizens United, five justices said, we believe that the First Amendment freedom of speech should be expanded to include corporations and, and labor unions. And that whatever money they spend in politics is the very essence of why we have this freedom of speech, is to enhance speech in the political arena, which is the most important arena that we have speech in. Even though the maintain feingold law says, no, we're going to restrict any kind of spending, this kind of spending by corporations, okay? So the question that you have to ask yourself um, is, do we want, even though we had Congress passing McCain-Feingold, putting the restrictions on political spending, do we want five justices to say, no, 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 we think that Congress should write it this way. We think that corporate spending is okay. Let's legislate and overwhelm, overcome the decision of the majority. So I ask, answer your question with a question. Hmm. All right. Um, so we have somebody with their hand up, and it looks like in the chat there's not really questions, but a lot of comments there. So can we go with the uh, go to uh, Alex and Senna uh, with their hand up? Yes. Okay, he's got to unmute himself, I think. Is it working? There. Okay. Um, I was wondering on, on the question of uh, uh, ministerial exceptions. How did the the vote go on that? What was the divide? Was it a straight liberal conservative thing or were there other factors? It was five conservatives against four liberals. That's it, straight down the yeah. line. Which is, which is the more common lineup, by the way. In this, in this year, we had, I think, 14 cases in which uh, they were voted with five to four. Um, and, uh, and only in, um, I think, uh, in, in, in about nine of those cases, nine or ten, they were basically all five conservatives or all or five liberals and four. It, it was the expected split. Okay, I, I, I got to ask though: is this you feel this is based on the respect that the various judges have uh, for religious institutions? Is that part of the yes, yes, the uh, Espinosa decision? Yeah. That was, that was based on the idea that, that um, if you disallow a parent from using scholarship money, to use that money into, a, let's say, a Catholic school or any religious school, right? But you allow another parent to use that same money, scholarship, public money, to go to a private non-sectarian school, that is treating the religious person unfairly. And uh, that violates that person's freedom, the, the uh, religious liberty. That's, that's the rationale. One more question. The, the, the idea of um, moral exempt, exemptions, exemption, is that strictly applied to health? Can yeah, you... yeah this, this, this is an interpretation of the Obamacare law, right? Obamacare, among other things, says that anybody who's required to provide insurance it has to cover certain minimum coverages. And for women, that minimum coverage includes certain preventive features, including uh, contraceptive coverage. Okay, so I couldn't use it as an argument that I should be exempt from, from gag laws on various issues. No, 
Now, this is strictly a rule by HHS uh, right. on Obamacare, that, that law. It's by, by HHS, by, by health services, not by these. Because Obamacare, uh, Obamacare, the law, delegated to HHS and a sub-agency called HRSA to write these rules. And those are the rules that are being subject to, to the litigation. Thank you. All right. Okay, let me just read these questions here. Um, I worked on the courts and judges do judge on political sides, which is their morals, which are not those of the people, and then use, it, use the law to approve it. And that is why law is blind. Uh, what are the morals of the people? I, uh, don't we all have different ideas around ethics and morality? Of course we do. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. The question is, should judges bring their values to the court? That's a, that's a good debate, all right? I'm certainly not going to say that ju the value, judges should, should not bring their values to the court. And I would have a hard time, though, defending to the max that judges should bring their values to the court, right? For the reasons we, we talked about. That's a very good discussion, by the way. Um, from Herman, uh, it may be not that good, but it is better than all the others. <laughs> kind of a quote from Winston Churchill. Other countries may have better legal systems than ours, but certainly these systems have come a long way from piss off the king, they chop off your head. Yeah. I agree. Um, we don't have a perfect system, not by a long shot. We have a pretty damn good system. All right. Um, usually at this point, uh, we switch to the general discussion. So I allow everybody to basically unmute themselves and, and directly ask questions and, and discuss in general. Is that fine? Um, okay, everybody can unmute themselves. It looks like uh, Kelso has his hand up. So if he wants to unmute and go ahead and ask the first question, go ahead. Yeah, the name is Celso. <clears throat> I just want to request that uh, you share a link to your slides. Uh, they were really excellent. And I'd uh, appreciate getting a copy of it. Uh, I'll send it to Brian. Or, or, or I, I, know, I, have, I have Brian's email address, so I'll send it to him. Or if you could post a link uh, on the chat, uh, we could copy it before we check out. That might work as well. Oh, I... Either way. Yeah, I don't, I'm not that sophisticated, so I will I'll probably have to send an email to, uh, to Brian. Thank you. Won't this be, won't this be uh, online within a week or two? Oh, I see, right. I think somebody's going to post the um, yeah. recording, but that's a little harder to get at, though, probably, yeah. rather than getting a slide to self. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to Brian. Yeah, we'll we'll have the video up. Uh, I don't know exactly when it'll be posted, but we've been doing pretty good about getting it about a, a week after, and it'll go up onto YouTube. I thought your point about the interpretation of the words and how the meaning of words changes over time was thought provoking, and I'm wondering. What are the pros and cons of having a court system to provide an interpretation or having a legislature that just re-legislates laws uh, based on current interpretations and will of the people? Well, that's a very deep question, and um, that deserves a long discussion. But let me, let me give an example to, to illustrate that. So in 1972, um, Jane Roe uh, challenged the Texas law that banned abortions except for, you know, to, to save the life of the mother. At that time, maybe three states had somewhat loosened some uh, abortion rules, but most every other state basically made it illegal. So you can say to Ms. Ms. Roe, um, well, uh, I hear you challenge. I know you want to get an abortion, but it's illegal. Tell you what, if you want to change the law, 
then you go to Austin and you lobby them and you try to change the law, right? That's how it works. You can't ask a judge to say, in spite of what the law says, I'm going to rewrite it, right? Now, you can't do that unless you have a constitutional provision under your interpretation that gives you an opening. Say, oh, you know, I think that this provision will allow for abortion. <laughs> so, so that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, the rock and the hard place, right? So if you, if you say, well, the proper way to do it is to um, get the legislature to change it, or even worse, you say, well, you can start a constitutional convention. You can get two-thirds of Congress to uh, both houses to propose an amendment to the Constitution, and then have it ratified by three quarters of the states, and then you say the, the amendment would say something like, Congress shall make no law respecting a woman's right to choose. Then we'll have it in the Constitution, and we're done. But the likelihood of either of those things happening are almost zero, at least since 1972. So the way to do it, if you're a good lawyer, <laughs> is you try to convince a judge that you, you have the ability to take the, whatever words of authority that are existing in today and, and put it in the concept of abortion, and, 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 and we're done. All I need is five votes from a judge. Sometimes that works well for society, depending on what your values are, right? Sometimes it doesn't work so well. Citizens United, maybe you don't like it that so much. Will we wait? Maybe you do like it. It's a great question, though. That, that itself deserves a good an hour discussion, actually. <laughs> One other thought is that it seems to me that the intent of something like a Supreme Court was to get more consistency with justices that serve for life versus a Congress that goes with the political wind and changes views pretty regularly. Yeah. And maybe, you know, depending on current events or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you pointed out, the, the whole purpose of having shielding uh, unelected judges from the vagaries of the political process, right? It's supposed to make judges uh, incorruptible, right? Unless you try to bribe them, I guess. But, but you know, they're supposed to be neutral. And, and, and the whole reason why you, you don't vote them out uh, or you cut their pay or something, uh, if, you don't, if you don't like it, uh, is so that they would be above the fray and be fair to whatever parties are in front of them. So in concept, that works very well. Um, and I say, in general, that still works very well. What that fails to, to consider, though, is that we have administrations, both sides, who really, really want to stack the deck and say, I want a judge that is not neutral. No, 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 no. I want, you know, I want a judge that is wholly on my side and will almost vote 100% either left or right on all these really controversial issues. And once we do that and combine that with lifetime appointment, then it becomes purely a political play. And we are just, we, we think of every confirmation process as a fight to, to, to life and death. And that's what we have now. And, and that's, that's there's also the uh, <clears throat> randomness of when justices die and what's going on in politics at the time and have a vacancy when you have basically a president that wants to put a liberal judge in place and you have a uh, Senate majority leader who won't allow it to come to a vote until the administration changes, that kind of stacks the deck as well. Yeah, you're exactly right. It, it's, it's unfortunate that this, this is what it's come to. Um, it would be probably better for everybody if we had more centrist judges who actually act like judges, right? Who don't have preconceived ideas one way or another and just try their best to, I mean, it's not a perfect process. We're all human beings, right? We're all sophisticated mammals. We're not gonna have any kind of uh, you know, perfection here, um, but uh, these are some of the problems, yeah.
Good. Well, how do we how do we work toward a Supreme Court that is more uh, objective? Yeah, you know, um, I don't know if you remember uh, when Pete Buttigieg was running. Um, he had actually a number. He focused on this issue a lot. He had a number of ideas that uh, I think are worth uh, thinking about. You know, things like uh, periodically shuffling um, circuit court judges to the Supreme Court, let them sit there for a spell, come back down, increase the size of the Supreme Court, um, you know, the, the change the confirmation process in a way that requires more uh, consensus, you know, all these things. Um, you know, and, and any of those can happen, actually. This is all by legislation, actually. Uh, all the cons Constitution doesn't set the number of judges, for example. I think that uh, Chief uh, Justice uh, Roberts was, in a sense, addressing this issue uh, in that uh, DACA case when he essentially told him, you guys hire a good lawyer to write the next thing you're going to do to address this question, uh, that what you set up here was just not sufficient. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that what um, Roberts did in DACA First of all, I think, I think that um, Roberts is very, very <laughs> sensitive about his role as Chief Justice, Justice and he's very sensitive to um, somehow being aligned at all with the way that President Trump describes the court, right? Mm -hmm. President Trump describes the court as if it was his court, and, and, um, and he criticizes, you know, the court whenever, as political, whenever they make a decision he doesn't like. So I think that Roberts is very sensitive to appearing to just succumb to, to uh, uh, Trump. Uh, because Trump loves the idea of, first of all, packing the court and then sending all of his touchy issues straight to the Supreme Court so that he doesn't have to deal with the political fallout. And DACA is one of these programs that happen to be you know, popular with general Americans, right? And so he wanted, is to be getting, gotten rid of in a way that, that he doesn't have to take a political hit. And, and, and I don't think, I don't think uh, Roberts is very crazy about that. I'm surprised that um, when Gorsuch ruled liberally on this recent case that you talked about, that Trump didn't fly into a, a Twitter rage. I mean, I think he said some things, but he didn't say, oh, I wish I hadn't appointed him or any of that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't remember what the things that he, that he said. Yeah, well, it wasn't that big. I mean, he didn't say something. I thought he would just fly into a rage. It's like, uh, how come I take, can't take people off the court? Yeah. Well, it's interesting, you know, um, you still have to ask the question, well, what, what motivated Gorsuch to do this, right? And, and I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, a judge will pride him or herself on being a real judge, meaning not bought out, not political, and it really, really works very well for somebody like Gorsuch, who is clearly a conservative, to say that um, the manner in which he interprets the Constitution doesn't always result in a conservative uh, you know, decision, right? And so he can point to this case and say, hey, I just call it as it is. Um, so that may be part of the motivation. But um, yeah. anyway, yeah, I don't want anybody to think that somehow they're just crass political animals up there pretending to be judges. That's not really fair, I don't think. You mentioned uh, textualism and, and original meaning as ways of interpreting the laws. Are there other common uh, methods? Yeah, um, you know, uh, not every judge has an avowed method. And uh, most judges, I would say, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a scholar in this, but most of the people who are justices um, just, uh, they have their biases, but they, they just use the normal kinds of interpretation, right? The normal, very reasonable kind, kinds of interpretation. Um, you know, if there's some, some, some judges like to use legislative history, right, to see what Congress or the legislature said. Um, some, some don't mind going to the historical records and see what, you know, the framers intended which is always kind of hard to do because there's so many framers and so many, so many different ideas, right? Um, but no, no, I, I don't think anybody has it. I mean, in general, you have what is called the living constitution crowd, 
which says, hey, let's not pretend that we don't, we can't, we, we don't interpret. Of course we interpret, we have to interpret, right? What is a reasonable search and seizure? You have to interpret that. There's no way around it. Um, you know, what is, uh, you know, any number of, what is free speech, right? What is a, what is a um, prohibition against uh, freedom of religion, right? What is an establishment? There's no, there's no code book here. Nobody wrote a code book. So judges have to apply some kind of value. And, and I would say that they just use all the tools in the, in, in the toolbox. And of course, you know, they won't use every tool, right? You'll never come to it. You have an analysis paralysis. They will frankly pick and choose um, just as we all do. We're all humans. It seems to me as though one of the more egregious things that's happened was in, uh, I think it was 1888 or 1886, where in Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific, uh, the court basically said that corporations are people without giving a reason for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the interesting thing was that, that um, that's not how the uh, court actually decided that case. Um, it was merely a, re a reporter's note that uh, characterized the case as having gone a certain way. So it's even worse than what you just said. Um, but anyway, um, but you know, corporations are persons for, for many, many reasons, right? They can be sued, they can sue, they can own property. Um, since they can be criminally prosecuted, they have certain um, First Amendment rights, I mean, uh, Bill of Rights, like, you know, search and seizure and things like that. Uh, so, so, so it's, it's not a, um, outlandish idea until you say that Hobby Lobby has a religion. I kind of crossed the line there. <laughs> uh, or that, um, you know, and, and you can we have, you know, endless discussions about Citizens United, right? I mean, is it, I mean, I, I, you've probably heard my presentation, you know, on Citizens United, I, I, I asked a provocative question in the very beginning. I say, what countries in the world in which you can be placed in prison for supporting a candidate for the highest office during an election? Right? And I offer things like you know, North Korea, you know, Saudi Arabia, United States. And I don't know about North Korea, I'm sure that's the answer is yes, but the United States is one of those countries before Citizens United, because the McCain-Feingold law makes it illegal for certain en entities to give more than what they, what they want to, what they are allowed to in an election, including individuals. So, so, you know, so that raises a real important question about, wow, what does freedom of speech mean if it doesn't apply in the realm of politics? So it's a, you know, it's not an easy question. I think it raises a lot of uh, really interesting discussions. Um, and corporations, obviously, they're not people. They're made up of people. Um, but anyway, it's a, you're all raising these questions that, you know, really deserve some really, really good in-depth uh, discussion. I'd love to do this sometime. I, I heard somewhere that one of the definitions of a, a person before the law is, is your person is, or being a person means you have um, um, moral responsibility. You know, a dog is not a person because it bites someone. It's not the dog's fault. It's, it's, not a, it's not a bad dog, but you might put it down because it doesn't have a right to life. Whereas a person is treated differently. He goes to court, he defends his action. Yeah, no, obviously that's... I wonder, if that, how, does that, apply to, that distinction apply to corporations too? Um, yeah, when, when Justice Alito decided the uh, Hobby Lobby case, which basically said Hobby Lobby is a corporation that has religion, um, what he did was he basically took the religion of the owners and equated the owners with the entity, which I think is not, not a proper way of doing it. But uh, yeah, it's a, good, it's a very good point. Um, I need to actually take off. Um, I have a one o'clock lunch appointment. 
It's been really fun. Uh, I love these uh, really uh, interesting and intelligent questions. Thank you all. And uh, yeah. I will send the, the notes. Can I ask a quick question? You were going to... You, uh, the, the slides would be included. I noticed that they were from a longer document, which intrigued me. I yeah, I I, I usually make it a little longer, but I think I couldn't I couldn't get into so much detail as I as I would want to. Yeah, so, well, yeah. well it was like a, a fifty page or forty something page document. Um, yeah, I skipped probably seven or eight uh, slides. Yeah. Okay. All right, Matthew, I'll leave it to you and thank you. All right.